Okay, the second season of your talk show, Star Talk, is beginning on National Geographic Channel. What made you decide to go from just looking at the stars to actually talking to stars? <laughs> yeah, that's a great uh, question. In fact, what I didn't realize at the time was that the act of talking to celebrities is what got it noticed by television because we're, we've been a radio show for five years and a podcast and that it turned out to be the magic ingredient that allowed it to jump species and uh, upon doing so I then realized that it's the first ever science-based talk show on television and if I bring in guests who are not scientists and then have a science conversation with them their fan base will see science orbit something that they thought science had nothing to do with. But you start off with people who aren't just Hollywood. For example, Bill Clinton, guest in the premiere of the second season of your show, he had an answer that I thought was fascinating where he talked about the fact that he wished he was 20 again because he basically wants to see where science and technology will take us. What did you think of that response? So, so I resonated deeply with that sentiment of his uh, that he wants to be young again so that he can live beyond his current natural life and just see what, what, one, what wondrous inventions uh, human ingenuity to, can bring to the table. You also talked to Andy Weir, the author of the book The Martians, who made into this big science fiction film by Ridley Scott. He said something interesting. He said he thought about you when he was writing his book. How did it make you feel and what did you think about that? He had read some of my earlier tweets regarding the film Gravity where I commented where they got some things wrong and he, he said when he was writing the science, uh, the, 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 the science suspense as it unfolds in his storytelling, he, he said in this interview, he said he imagined that I was sitting over his shoulder watching because if he gets something wrong, I'm going to tweet about it. <laughs> so, so, yes, I was honored that he thought I would be his, his, his police. But uh, I think... Uh, I, I think my, my tweets are occasionally misunderstood. People think I'm just a, a curmudgeon, but I really just want people to celebrate uh, the science that could or, or might not have appeared in a film. And, and, and uh, I think it can be empowering, actually, in storytelling. If you knew all the physics that does exist in the universe and you had access to it, like Andy Weir did, you can tell a, a pretty potent story, as I think he did. Now, I know you're talking to show Keeping Up With Geek Culture, that's important to you. Did you watch the trailer for Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and what is your professional take uh, on so, that trailer? So, I was busy, I was like, giving a public talk when that trailer was released. That's no excuse. You've got to go there so and front of the computer. Are you kidding me? It's my only excuse Give me I your have. geek card. It's my only excuse, excuse that I have. You've got to take it. Uh, so I have not yet seen the trailer. But what I can tell you is Star Wars as a franchise has no premise of being scientifically accurate. When you are that kind of storytelling, I don't spend time analyzing what you're doing. So whereas if you do... Is Star Trek, for example, that franchise. In there, there are science officers, there are engineers, there's some pretense of reality going on, and they've earned the, the attention I would give it to judge whether they did something right or wrong. But Star Wars, just sit back and enjoy the story. Now, I do have a serious worry when it comes to some science fiction films. You know, recently people talked about Back to the Future Day and, compare, and you compared in your tweets where we are in reality versus where people predicted would be. The films like Blade Runner, they're supposed to take place in 2019, and yet we haven't gotten a lot of the technology we've seen in those movies. Do you worry as an astrophysicist that our dreams are outpacing where we actually are when it comes to science and what's happening there? So, all right, just because we don't match what a futurist says about the future, uh, am I upset? In some cases, yes. But there are other things that we are far beyond what the futurist imagined. Consider the film 2001, which came out in 1968. They imagined a future where there was one central computer that controlled everything. Are they imagining that we have powerful computers on our hips, accessing uh, 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 the world of knowledge and information in an instant? Did they imagine that? No, they didn't. Did they imagine that you'd carry around a basically a TV screen with you in the same device that you used to communicate with? No. So I'm, take the whole picture, the whole, all of society. There are places we are that I don't think they imagined. And, and no, it's not going to happen exactly as they say, but that makes it that much more interesting. Yes, I want the flying car and the hoverboard. I'm disappointed. Yes. But 
they showed thumbprint locks in, in, in Back to the Future 2, which took place October 21st in the year 2015. So uh, here's one thing I got completely wrong. They said Cubs would sweep the World Series. Didn't happen. And on that night, the Mets. Cubs got Mets, swept. Baby. They yeah. got swept by the Mets. So that one... You know, they, they Who could have predicted that. that, though? So, <laughs> well, Dr. Tyson, thanks a lot for coming to the Wall Street Journal. Well, listen, it says cafe, and there's no, co there's no you, you don't serve, what? It's supposed to be a cafe The, the coffee here. is a metaphor, <laughs> okay? You can imagine drinking it. Where is the, where is the barista? Where is the... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for your third season we'll have that, okay? okay?